Okay, we uh, discussed last time uh, a sequence of models, and uh, in some shorthand notations, it's very easy to summarize them. Uh, uh, namely, uh, we start the, with the model where the dynamic, the dynamic uh, variable was uh, the relevant dynamic variable was the phase of the. Uh, creation annihilation operators um, and uh, the model the, we wrote the Lagrangian or the anon chain the Euclidean language as integral d mu phi plus external field square we wrote uh, and physically we argued that this model describes uh, uh, superfluids um, the uh, next model was when the dynamical variable was a mu this time. And so you have f mu nu, which is d mu a nu minus d nu a nu. Uh, plus, uh, we uh, made this. To, to, to have uh, more consistency with notations. Let's write it down like that. Plus uh, f mu nu external. So we probe the system. In order to see what happens to the system, we probe it with the um, external field. This external field, uh, in case of uh, superfluid, was just uh, either the velocity uh, of homogeneous motion, or uh, it could also be rotation. It's actually quite interesting to see um, uh, what happens, what kind of a mu would correspond to rotation, and what would be the effect of rotation. Actually, experiments with superfluids uh, were done um, uh, most uh, uh, spectacular facts about superfluids, superfluids come from the experiments with rotating um, buckets, so to say. Uh, anyway, this thing, square, um, this thing, uh, as we will discuss uh, quickly today, uh, describes confinement. Uh, there are also uh, higher models. You can now uh, go um, as far as you like here, we can now say let's take the model in which uh, dynamical variable is f mu nu. Um, what would be your suggestion for the Lagrangian if I want this model? You see the uh, analogies. So we start with dynamical variable phi, uh, external field a mu, then we say let's take a mu as a dynamical field and f mu external field, and now we need uh, what, the next step. What, what, what would you do? Take what? F mu nu, but what's the Lagrangian? What Lagrangian I should write in terms of, yeah, that's correct. Uh, I want to take f mu nu. Huh? Yeah. What? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, you see, you probably notice here that this thing is zero. If it is zero, we have a mu expressed like that. Uh, if um, a plus to probe this system, we will need uh, the third rank tensor, and so on. Now, this is uh, while these two guys uh, are we, we definitely encounter in nature. Um, higher, higher examples of this stuff. Um, well, they it one encounters with this. Uh, think uh, in string theory, 
but there's no, so far, there's no uh, well-established application of those models. Um, with higher, still, they are very nice and uh, very natural and so on. The models, by the way, all the models um, become non-trivial. The, the, this, as written, if nothing is added, it would be trivial models. Um, but what makes them non-trivial is are the instantons, uh, namely the subtle point of the en of the energy, which with finite value of energy, which are non-trivial. There is. Let's remove for one moment a mu external the external fields. Uh, then clearly, phi equals zero is. Uh, is a minimum of the action, but there are also the, the key point responsible for dynamics of superfluids and confining theories is the fact that there are um, subtle points in the action which are non-trivial, for which phi is discontinuous. And we saw that if you allow 2 pi discontinuity, then you get a non-trivial contribution then the partition function you have the partition function which depends on those variables mm. which defines uh, free energy in turn um, and uh, the the, the, those uh, uh, instantons, they actually uh, cause, sometimes cause phase transitions and so on. Also, they select a special dimensions uh, for each model. Um, here, the special dimension was two. In this case, the instanton was the vortex, quantized vortex. Uh, it, was, it was really actually the vortex which is observed in superfluid and these vortices uh, are actually have cir the circulation, the strength of these vortices is quantized. Uh, remember why they are quantized? Why we have uh, What forces quantization of vortices? Hmm? What? Uh, well, gauge transformation is automatic here, so it's not good. Uh, well, something more than that. When we write, uh, well, you see, when we write phi as uh, sum of q a uh, imaginary part log z minus z a. That's precisely, by the way, the way you, in hydrodynamics, you write, in classical hydrodynamics, you write the, the potential for, uh, for vorticity, for tornadoes. Uh, but in, here, in this problem, uh, this discontinuity of this guy is should be integer because uh, we should have continuous psi, the psi operator we wrote down from the very beginning we wrote it down as absolute value of psi multiplied by e to the i phi and if you psi is a physical variable it's creation uh, or annihilation operator so if you it must be univalued if you it must not have singularities. If you go around a big circle, phi must uh, be changed by the 2 pi multiplied by, by an integer. So there is periodicity. And I remind you also um, that uh, the uh, origin of this discontinuous uh, this discontinuous uh, configuration is not something you add by hands. 
uh, they appear from, cal from the calculations, from the passing to continuous limit of the lattice model. If you have a lattice model with periodic phi's uh, or with periodic a's, um, then you are simply, you simply must uh, add instantons to the, it's not a question of whether you want it or not. They are just there. Um, okay, and uh, so we have this um, periodicity and uh, we, uh, which is effectively leads to the violation, we said this last time, to, to the violation of Bianchi identity, namely if we denote B mu as D mu phi, then from this multivaluedness we conclude that D mu, B mu, I'm just repeating what I wrote last time, is sum of QA delta function of X minus XA. It's a two-dimensional delta function. Absolutely. And we said uh, the analog of this, so the special dimension here is two. Um, and that's because uh, uh, because of this thing. Uh, and um, you can also write this condition as d mu phi dx mu equal to 2 pi n. Um, in this case, uh, as I mentioned, I just want to remind you I want you to keep this, uh, to remember this, that precisely the same formula if you treat the crystal uh, with uh, defects. Uh, you, uh, if you treat the, you take a crystal and you go to, con to the continuum limit. Then it is characterized by deformation U alpha, but U alpha there is analogous periodicity of U alpha because when you displaced, if you have periodic crystal, the displacement of the atom by uh, by the lattice uh, lattice constant uh, doesn't change anything. The energy is periodic in this on a, on the lattice. In the discrete version, it's periodic. The memory which remains about this crystal structure when we describe things continuously, uh, is just uh, the same ambiguity of U alpha, which is called the dislocation. And then this phase transition of, uh, when dislocation, uh, as you increase temperature, uh, there are more and more dislocation in the crystal. And finally, at some critical point, there is a phase transition melting. Um, and now, melted phase, what it corresponds to in superfluid? What do you think? In superfluid, in also, superfluid. Huh? In superfluid. Yeah, in norm, the normal phase, when you have finite correlation length, it's analogous to the melted phase. The, lower, the superfluid phase, analogous to the crystal order. And... Uh, in terms of this guy, uh, what it uh, corresponds to the, those uh, um, melted and uh, crystal phases, uh, they correspond to what? So if you have melted, you have many vortices. Which... In melted, you have what? The... Vortices. Yes, you have, well, first of all, we have here um, not not exactly vortices, but uh, in this case we have magnetic monopoles. Uh, so instead of this equation, in the, this is instead of this equation, we have the equation that um, what do we have? We have if we denote f mu nu as d mu a nu minus d nu a nu. Uh, again, it satisfies uh, the, ident the modified Bianchi identity plus cycles is sum of QA 
delta of x minus xa uh, multiplied by epsilon mu nu lambda. Um, and that uh, precisely means that if you use the Stokes theorem, um, and suppose you have one, one uh, monopole located here, then uh, what's the geometrical meaning of this relation for one monopole, for a single monopole? How can you use uh, vector analysis to make some conclusion? Yeah, so uh, what, what kind, here we have, uh, we can write it down as integral d mu dx mu in equal to 2 pi n. And um, what would be the analog of uh, this for this case? It will be the flux through the sphere. It will be essentially, um, you have a sphere and the total flux, if you introduce uh, f mu nu, the vector as the magnetic field b lambda. Is simply the flux BDS equal to 4 pi Q. And that's the analog of this guy. In the second, in the second, huh? in the second, in the second case. case, exactly. Yes, oh, I'm sorry. Now, but okay, but now we will talk about the third one. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah. So uh, you see the critical dimension, then the, the special, I would not call it critical, the special dimension uh, for vortices is 2, for monopoles is 3. Um, now, what would you think here, we have here? In this case. Uh, uh, well, we have Again, you have the same uh, structure, and if we write it down, this as integral f menu d sigma menu, where d sigma menu is the area element. It's, it uh, actually is very naturally uh, generalized to this thing. Uh, you simply say here that. Um, Mm. Now uh, we introduce the third rank tensor d mu f mu lambda plus cycles, and uh, the instantons for this case will be uh, point-like, uh, point-like in four dimensions. So that's why, by the way, it's an interesting model because it might be related to the other, to the non-abelian four-dimensional instantons. But um, let's not discuss it right now. Uh, in any case, uh, the same thing will happen here. You will here we integrate over S two, and which is a boundary of S three of R three. We have the space R three. And uh, the boundary is S2, we integrate, and we get this magnetic flux completely analogously in the case of uh, you integrate now over three dimensional hypersurface. Uh, and it's equal to, it's proportional to the integer. Um, uh, so, uh, well, that's a nice picture, uh, but let's now uh, try to make it to, to, to tie it to some concrete physics. It's kind of mathematical structures which appear very naturally here, but um, what is physics? Uh, well, um, as I said, for this case, it's, there's no clear answer. The only thing I can tell to, if some of you know uh, details of string theory, uh, they describe, there's the 
and has five brains. And uh, if you compactify space to have four non-compact dimensions, the NS5 brains, uh, they, will, they will be point-like and they will be described by this uh, anti-symmetric field. But it's not far from clear that whether we can use it in some concrete physical question. At the same time, here, uh, the, 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 this is completely physical. That, that I shall explain now. Um, Uh, so, I, last time I uh, briefly mentioned uh, that uh, we get this effective action. Th those are effective action. We just took some complicated uh, microscopic action and uh, eliminate all uh, massive modes and we go to the long range, uh, to the long range limit in which only soft modes uh, contribute. And that's in this way we got uh, this uh, action. So let's concentrate now on this three-dimensional case. Uh, and uh, the first thing which we will see, which we see from this is that um, uh, those, uh, the if you calculate, uh, we can easily calculate uh, the, um, uh, uh, this flux from, from this formula. It follows that if you have this uh, magnetic field B is proportional to Q, the charge of the magnetic monopole, X uh, divided by X cubed. Uh, when you have several of these, just uh, have just superposition. I have just sum Q A X minus X A. Uh, this is just the solution. Uh, 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 actually, the corresponding formula with vortices was, uh, I, 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 will, I, I, I think it's worth uh, writing uh, that d mu phi for the vortices uh, will be proportional to sum of q a epsilon mu nu x minus x a nu divided by x minus x a square uh, notice that the phase is dimensionless, so it's proportional to 1 over x. This we get by differentiating the logarithm. I used to write the phi in terms of the imaginary part of the logarithm, but that's just this. And uh, as I already mentioned in, st in elementary hydrodynamics, uh, this is precisely the expression for the velocity of a single vortex with constant circulation. Uh, it's a solution of the, uh, of the Euler equation. And you have ideal hydrodynamics. But, uh, and those vortices, by the way, they, when there are many of them in classical hydrodynamics, uh, they interact in an interesting way. Um, there is the Kirchhoff equation which governs them and so on. So they move in a very tricky way. Uh, uh, in quantum theory, this is quantized. And uh, this is the generalization of this formula. This time, uh, the vector potential has dimension 1 or x. So the field strength must have dimension 1 or x squared. And you can continue as easily as I'm doing it here. You can continue and find the instantons for these guys. Very simple. Um, I suggest it as a home exercise. You just find the, the explicit uh, minima of this action. Now, the value of energy uh, will be uh, the following. When you integral, it's, it's integral d square d3x 
it's just this magnetic energy. And um, the, when you take B square, there's, there are two terms, two type of terms. Mm. First of all, you will get sum for A not equal to B. Uh, terms with contains QA and QB. And uh, how would you estimate uh, what else should I write here when I calculate the value of this energy? Uh, yeah, we can use dimensional analysis. You see it's 1 over x squared. 1 or x to the fourth, and uh, so it's, you get just the Coulomb interaction between these, these guys. Uh, and then there is a slight embarrassment uh, when you look at the diagonal terms a equal b, um, because we get sum or a integral d, uh, qa square uh, integral d3x divided by x to the fourth which is divergent. Now, what would be your explanation of why, how to deal with it? Or in in more pragmatic way, what where the cutoff comes from? There is certainly a cutoff. Yeah, but uh, it's because we obtained it as a low energy limit from the lattice. You see? So there's just lattice spacing which uh, enters here. And that gives us some self-energy of a vortex, um, which is uh, uh, some constant. So the total epsilon is sum of some constant, which depends on the lattice. Q a square, uh, so it it uh, takes some energy to create. This is the mass, the energy of the vortex of each individual vortex, plus and actually the Q a and Q b are arbitrary integers. What we in, if we want to calculate something, we have, for example, the partition function, we have to do the following procedure. It's sum over A, excuse me, sum over QA's um, and you have E to the minus beta sum QA, QB uh, divided by RAB. Um, and we uh, have, uh, as it is, and QA are, in fact, turns out that what is relevant are QA and QB being plus and minus one. Yes, uh, I forgot to write it down, you are right product D3XA. So this is the class, we reduced uh, the quantum, uh, the quantum partition function to the classical partition function of a plasma. You have just uh, a plasma which consists of plus and minus charges. Uh, and mm, it's just the classical partition function, classical free energy, logarithm of it is a classical free energy uh, for this plasma. Uh, and now, as, as you can be sure, there is a plenty of things which are know, well known about the plasma. Uh, namely, um, if you have, what would be the difference if you have some dielectric of some insulator and you put an electric charge inside. What happens to Coulomb interaction? Uh, uh, to cool, uh, suppose you have two charges 
inserted into the, an, us, into an insulator, uh, plus and minus, how they would interact. Exactly, with a Coulomb of dialectic constant. And now, uh, it will be still the Coulomb law, just some. Now, let's suppose we have a, uh, the, the dialectic constant comes because, because of the dipole screening. Now, uh, when you take this case and you insert two charges in the plasma, uh, what will happen here? Uh, yeah, so what will be the interaction? What kind of interaction? Is it? Yeah, yeah, right. Right, and you see this from the mean field approximation very simply. Um, it's Debye, uh, Debye screening, yes. Uh, uh, now I shall, don't have much time to, to discuss it, but uh, this Debye screening is extremely important. Uh, it tells you that in our system there are no long range order but everything has some effective, uh, effective screening, effective mass. H how to uh, describe this? Uh, actually, a good way to, uh, uh, to the, the Debye method consists of, of the following. You introduce the electrostatic or magnetostatic potential, phi of x, and uh, you write down the equation, the Poisson equation, that this should be equal to the density. And for the dense, how to find the mean density? It's pre what, what I'm describing is precisely the, the mean field approximation which we discussed at the beginning of these lectures. Uh, so um, now you are, you are saying, so in our plasma we have uh, uh, we, we have uh, the uh, distribution of density, and we have to figure out uh, what would be the average density at, at a given point, how it, ex it is expressed in terms of uh, uh, scalar potential. You can say, of course, what you do know is that rho of x is sum of QA uh, uh, sum of uh, no, I should not uh, go this way. Uh, so, uh, any suggestions for the density in the field of the potential? And, huh? Some Boltzmann Yeah. So, well, there is a simple familiar formula. Suppose we have a gravitational field. Uh, and we study the potential, potential uh, gravitational potential. Uh, there's the barometric formula, which tells you that uh, if you have potential energy U of x, then density of particles, density of the, of the atmosphere at the point x, is proportional to e to the minus beta U of x. That's the barometric formula. So how? Now I want to use the similar formula here. It's slightly modified. Uh, what would be? Uh, actually, you see, uh, you will have the, the key difference with the gravitational case is that here you have two, two type of charges, positive and negative. The positive charges will give you e to the beta phi, the negative e to the minus beta phi of x. Uh, so you get this uh, Debye equation, and that can be it can be justified that uh, it's uh, right approximate. Uh, delta function. Uh, well, if you want to add an external charge, which delta function you have in mind? Uh, so not. Now X is at the center of the chart, right? Oh, no, no, we, we do it this way. Mm, we write down, instead of this, we write down as E to the minus beta, sum uh, QA phi of XA. Um, 
now the um, as, as, as it is, and there is the term e to the minus epsilon square. Now, in principle, uh, this is the contribution to the density. Uh, right, but the, from the first term we have delta. From this one? Yeah. No, it's, uh, I don't think so. I don't no, I don't. I think that's the equation. If you have an external density of charge, of course you have to add it here. Uh, in any case, let's uh, l let me proceed here. Um, the, the, it's just uh, the way to treat this. There are many methods for working with this. In particular, remember I, at the beginning of the lectures, I described for you the the representation using. Uh, uh, functional, functional derivatives and Feynman diagrams. You can very well use this uh, here and you can estimate the error and find that for, for, small, for uh, large enough beta uh, Debye approximation is accurate and there is no phase transition. That's quite uh, interesting and amazing that um, the plasma for any beta uh, screens, the Debye screening is present always in the plasma in three dimensions. In two dimensions, this, it was different. If you have two dimensional Coulomb plasma, then there is a phase transition. And now I'm asking you the question uh, what will happen, what physically it means? Do, what do you think? We, we, we see that we, we are. First of all, the analogous phase where we have a finite correlation length. We have finite correlation length. The charge is screened and it's, uh, if you calculate its uh, inter interaction energy of two charges, they are exponential, as you said. Um, and it's all, which phase is it? Is it the phase of confinement or deconfinement? Well, not quite. Um, it's deconfinement for magnetic charges, but it will be confinement for electric charges. I will I will explain this in a moment. But I shall I want to give you first the intuitive argument, and then we will derive it. Uh, uh, so magnetic charges indeed are deconfined. Uh, plasma, those monopoles are flying freely around this, and it's in. Uh, it is in contrast with two dimension when you have logarithm here, and in this case, with since because of logarithm is growing, there is a critical point. Uh, we dis uh, discuss this in two D, whether you have. Uh, Mm, mag uh, dipole, uh, 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 magnetic dipoles in one phase and they decay to vortices uh, or I call it vortex molecules uh, in one phase and vortices, free vortices in another. Here we always have deconfined magnetic charges flying around. Um, now, now imagine uh, that you have a, I'm giving now this uh, intuitive argument. Uh, imagine that electric charge tries to propagate uh, and all around him uh, there are flashes uh, of magnetic charges, those instantons, which, uh, which are localized in time because three is dimension of space-time here. So those magnetic monopoles, uh, they are localized in time. They are not particles. Uh, they are just flashes of fields. And as a result of these random flashes, uh, the electric charge uh, cannot propagate far. Uh, in condensed matter physics, uh, there is a similar phenomenon um, of non-propagation, do, do, can, huh? 
Localization. Localization, yes. Uh, actually, uh, in a, in a, in a, when you have, in, in condensed matter physics, if you have many, enough impurities, uh, then uh, the particle cannot, uh, it just loses its way, it cannot, doesn't know where to go, and it's exponentially localized. Uh, here we have this similar situation, and but it of course remains to be uh, this. This is the intuitive argument uh, that uh, deconfinement of magnetic charges corresponds to confinement of electric charges. It remains to be seen, and I will show you how to see it very quickly and simply. Um, <coughs> Yes. Are you saying impurities are this magnetic Yes, the role of impurities is played by this randomly. You see, here we sum over all, po we, we have this sum, in this sum there is one term which is no magnetic monopole, then one, then two, then three, and so on. And then they proliferate in this part when you calculate this partition function. And mean field of this monopole is described by this Debye equation. Uh, and uh, they play the role of impurities so that when electric charge tries, tries to propagate through this system, it, it loses its way and it's, it gets localized. There is no propagation for electric charges. And that I will show you now, quantitatively. Parameter, yes, absolutely. It's tightly related to the disorder parameter. Absolutely correct. It's it's quantitatively so. Yes, uh, you can actually. People recently made a lot of progress in analyzing disorder. The, Definition of disorder parameter here is obvious, but uh, people actually studied uh, quantitatively the correlation functions and uh, how uh, how they interact with the order parameter and so on. There was a lot of work recently on this, especially in supersymmetric theory. But I, I, I will not go to this work to describe this work. Only remind you that the, to define the disorder parameter in in these systems, it's it's direct uh, generalization of what we have in the Ising model. In in two D, you have vortex, and uh, you attach the tail and change the sign of coupling. Uh, not not change the sign of coupling, but uh, ascribe the integer. Uh, integer potential to, to each side. Um, and when we have 3D, we put the disorder parameter here and uh, we actually associate integer coupling, uh, the jump, the discontinuity to, 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 to this plaquette. If you are interested, I, I, I can give you more details about it. But, uh, we have to move. Uh, anyway, the analogy with disorder parameter is very precise here. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the, mm, I, I, I'll give you the reason why it all works this way. And for that, what we need some criterion for confining charges. And a very convenient criterion uh, is the following. And again, I will uh, use the analogy. It's the same, the same story for all these guys. Uh, I shall use this. Uh, it is sometimes easy, easier and more efficient to understand several things at once, not a single one, but just to take them as a. Uh, as a collection and work with that. Uh, so in uh, the case of uh, in the case of uh, 2D vortices uh, 
uh, we can just cal we have to calculate the correlation function. The simplest correlation function is this. It is just the correlation if you have uh, red arrows here. It's just the correlation between the scalar product of the error, real part of it will be the scalar product of the arrow here and the arrow somewhere here. And that's g of r. And what vortex contributes here is the contribution of a single, let's suppose that we have a, we want to calculate the contribution of a single vortex. Um, that's one vortex. Uh, so we have two points, 0 and r. And let's suppose that the vortex is located at the point x. Uh, how geometrically you would uh, estimate the contribution of a single vortex into this correlation function? Remember that the vortex was basically the, 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 the classical phi for a vortex was, um, well, it was imaginary part of the logarithm of, uh, if it is at the point y, y minus x in complex notation. But it, what, what it means, actually, uh, really, it, it simply means that if you have a vortex at the point x, the classical value uh, at the point y is equal to what? What is phi classical at y? The, this is the location, the location of the vortex. And this is the point of observation. And I want to know, it's just the angle. You, you take an arbitrary, it doesn't matter uh, angle relative to what. Because uh, if I take, so we can just as well consider the angle relative to the arbitrary axis. And uh, it doesn't matter because in the difference, uh, if you change axis, it, so um, now geometrically figure out what, what you should do here to, to take uh, the, to get a contribution. No, what I would need to do if the position of the vortex, what? Yes, exactly. You take this and this, and this is this angle. And um, it. How can one easily see, see this? It, how can what? Oh, it's uh, oh because it just you can just explain shape the, the classical. I mean, how how do you easily see this? That uh, that it is the action. Or yeah. It's more or less by definition that's important to understand. That's simple and important to understand. Uh, you simply say that. Um, uh, the I'm calculating in at the saddle point it's phi classical at zero minus phi classical at r mm, right. phi classical at zero is the angle uh, is the angle well, let's uh, agree uh, that there's some fixed axis and this is the angle relative to this one this is relative to this one and since there's a difference uh, you get just this. So it's just this angle, and uh, it is um, actually uh, the contribution of one vortex to the correlation function will be the following. It will be e to the minus some constant uh, q square. Um, if I if the vortex has a vorticity q, uh, e to the i q alpha of uh, let me see of 
x minus alpha of x minus r. And that will be s simply the, uh, the logarithm of the ratio. Uh, it will be in complex notations. It will be log x divided by x minus r and imaginary part of it. Um, and uh, we, what we immediately see is that if x is very far, uh, then this angle is small. So it will not, uh, we immediately can evaluate uh, the important, important position which influence this correlation. Uh, what would be the evaluation for, what, what will, what sh where x should be? Because you know we have to integrate our position of this, uh, but if things are very far, if x is very far, it's clearly round. So what is, yeah, it's actually x of the order of r, which will be relevant. And that will give us um, the following contribution. Again, you, you can have some practice and calculate it carefully, but I want Sometimes, uh, you know, estimate, qualitative estimates are much more illuminating than exact calculation. Um, that's basically for the reason that uh, um, you see when you have some qualitative argument and qualitative estimate, it may be often happens it's much easier to generalize than the exact calculation. The exact calculation relates to one particular problem, while the qualitative argument often uh, unites several problems. Anyway, that's just a, uh, just philosophy. And uh, in any case, you get the contribution to the partition function or to correlation function Oh, which um, is uh, proportional to r square because the, you integrate over position of x uh, multiplied uh, by some c q square. That's the estimate. Uh, okay, but we, I don't want to go uh, to to, to uh, uh, go further with vortices because. Confining, uh, confining theory is much more interesting and, in a sense, simpler. Um, this I was just uh, giving you as a, as a simple example. But uh, let's now go to 3D. And the first thing which we have to decide is what kind of object we want to calculate what kind of object corresponds to phi of r minus phi of 0 in 2D. In 3D, we, we need something which depends on the vector potential, some correlation of the vector potential. Well, one thing which we can calculate, of course, is which is not, uh, well, it's fairly interesting, but not the main thing. We can calculate the correlation function of gauge invariant quantities like f mu nu, f lambda gamma. Uh, but the best thing, the best correlation function which really uh, tests confinement, deconfinement, and the presence of string is what is called the Wilson loop. Uh, and it Actually, I shall explain uh, its origin. I shall first write it down, and that's what we will be calculating, but then I will explain its physical meaning. Uh, so that's um, one thing, but more generally, we can introduce the thing, the Wilson loop, which is the expectation value of a mu dx mu over integrated over a certain contour. 
Um, and um, as, as, as I shall explain, it, in, it uh, directly measures the interaction energy of quark and anti-quark. But let's first see uh, this, by the way, is a limiting cases uh, of the Wilson loop that the, you have two contours, of which if, if the contour shrinks to zero, you get F mu nu. Uh, uh, by the way, the um, uh, what will be the analogous thing in this third model? So we go in 2D, we have this thing. In 3D, we get this thing. And we, by the way, we can actually write it down uh, in a... Uh, hmm? Yeah, it is gauge invariant. Uh, but uh, let's also write it down in this way. It's e to the... from 0 to r d mu phi dx mu. Uh, in 2D, it is, uh, w what would be the corresponding formula in 3D? Exactly, yes. So we have F menu, D sigma menu, um, with the condition that uh, over the surface S and the boundary of this surface S is our contour C. Um, now, uh, and now, in this case, it's now quite obvious that uh, what will be, what will replace the Wilson loop in the third model? Well, first of all, what kind of quantity it will be? Wilson loop depends on the loop. And uh, what, what can you say about the model number three? The surface. Yeah, it will depend on the surface. And of course, it will be the same formula. This is uh, 3D and 4D. It will be e to the i integral. Mm, uh, I call it uh, h mini lambda. So we integrate over three-dimensional surface, and the boundary uh, will be two-dimensional surface. It will, be, as a result, we will get the object which which depends on the two-dimensional surface. Um, now one more uh, question. Uh, you see, generally speaking, uh, all these guys, these, when I write it in this way, it uh, can depend, uh, when I write it in this way, w which, which there are many surfaces uh, with, with the boundary being C. Why it doesn't, and here we also can find many different paths uh, connecting 0 and R. So, uh, why it doesn't matter which path, when you include all these uh, vortices and why the answer will be the same for any path or for any surface with this condition. Yes, uh, but uh, it will be a solid angle, you are right, but uh, I wanted to say something more elementary, namely more straightforward. Uh, when you look at the contribution of, uh, when you change the path, uh, if there are no vortices here, then it's clearly path independent. But when vortices are present, it's generally speaking path dependent, because d mu phi is uh, not, phi is not univalued anymore. However, if you have two paths connecting 0 and r, and there is a, there is a uh, vortex inside, uh, its contribution will be e to the 2 pi i q to this thing uh, because of this equation. So when q is quantized, it will not be, it will be path independent. So 
in all these cases, it's very important that the the uh, the strength of the instantons is quantized in, in all these cases. Uh, okay, and. Oh, but it's because um, here we have 3D. Uh, we say that a mu will allow discontinuities in uh, f mu. Uh, but these discontinuities, uh, the, the a mu is peri it came from the periodic a mu. So periodicity means that f mu discontinuity should be. 2 pi n mu, where n is uh, n is is the integer. Uh, so, uh, which means that when you have, remember the picture, the Dirac picture I draw to you yesterday. You have magnetic monopole, and we have an infinite solenoid, and we uh, actually. Mm, Calculate the flux, mm. uh, the flux of this thing, which cancels uh, this uh, this thing, and then the so this infinite tail is physically irrelevant. You don't see it uh, if you have charged particles scattering. You don't see it if there is quantization of if if the magnetic charge is integer. Let me, maybe it's uh, worth explaining a little more. Uh, the statement, first of all, that if you started, again, there is, it's, w w what I want to convey is that there is nothing arbitrary here. Everything is precise and fixed. Uh, so let's look at this thing. Uh, this is a, the limit of the action for which the energy is cosine fx mu nu, where fx mu nu is a circulation like ax mu plus ax plus mu nu minus ax plus mu nu minus ax nu. So it's, and all ax mu I assumed to be angular variable they change from 2 pi to 0. Okay, uh, so the mathematical state, now the precise mathematical statement is that when you, in the continuum limit, when you uh, replace all finite differences by derivatives and so on, um, if fx mu nu has a discontinu, if f mu nu of x um, no, I should put it differently. The, the, the mathematical statement is this, that uh, extrema of this action are described, the tri there are infinitely many extremal points here. The trivial point is then all A are equal to zero, but uh, the non-trivial points are the, are the cases then A is given by uh, arbitrary configuration of magnetic monopoles which are quantized. They are quantized because A is periodic. And that, I, then that will take some time for me to, well, I gave you many various arguments uh, concerning it. But, um, so, uh, so that's very important that if they are quantized. Uh, it's, and you can view this either as a consequence of, uh, well, maybe it's so important I should give one more argument. Uh, you see, uh, normally you replace, you try to replace cosine by, by if f is small, you, you're saying that it goes to f minus nu square of x, cosine f minus. You expand it, in, so you, you, you say it's, a, it's actually a minus here, cosine minus cosine f is a constant 
plus uh, one half half mu square plus higher terms which don't interest us. And you might say that this is the limit when the lattice spacing tends to zero. However, it's not completely right because uh, in order to reach this limit, you, you, what, what you are saying here is that as a goes to zero, uh, all uh, higher terms will contain powers of a and so the only relevant terms will be this. If f menu is not uh, small enough, you will get 1 over a contribution to epsilon. However, it will be also true if fx menu is close, uh, uh, is close to 2 pi n. You see, because cosine is periodic. So you are al allowed to have a huge f menu. Uh, but quantized one, and it will not, the action for this app configuration will not be large, okay? Um, and um, when you calculate the flux, uh, this 2 pi n menu will give you uh, the quantized contribution of the monopole. Um, it's a bit subtle, and it's worth uh, talking and thinking about it. Um, it's just this, um, so the reason is basically the same as, as we have here. The phi was periodic, that it inherited some periodic structure uh, from those things. Uh, but let me proceed, maybe I shall return uh, to this uh, periodicity question and quantization question. Uh, now we, we can easily calculate the contribution of one monopole to the Wilson loop. Uh, you have the loop, you have the monopole at the point X, um, and um, then you can uh, immediately tell me what, what will be the contribution of this monopole how to find, remember the experience with, in 2D, what will be the 3D experience? Blocks. This will be solid angle, yes. Uh, it, when you sense uh, B is, um, you, you, what, all you have to do is uh, to uh, take, um, um, to take some arbitrary surface and integrate B over this surface. And that's, uh, since B is 1 over x square, it's precisely the solid angle, its dimension. So it's completely the same thing uh, as in the case of instanton, but as in the case of vortices. So, uh, but le le let's uh, write down the estimate. It will be e to the minus uh, Q square. In fact, I didn't write electric charge. I shall restore it electric charge here, uh, multiplied by some non-universal constant. Mm. So as electric charge tends to zero, it seems to be uh, infinite. It seems to be very suppressing. However, um, what would be the size if uh, the loop has dimension r, size r, what will be the typical, what will be the r-dependent factor here? No, it will be r cubed because we are in 3D space. So you see that uh, the contribution of, uh, of this one, um, and once again, well, the logic is that when you go very far away, the integral converges, uh, but uh, when you are close, it gives you R cube contribution. You see that for any E0, there are such large R that uh, the, the instanton contribution becomes important. And since one instanton becomes important, uh, all of them will become important. It will be 
uh, when you, you have two, you will get factors r to the six. So although you lose, and the, the key point is that this is the energy of magnetic monopole. And this is the entropy, since it can be anywhere in space. So the entropy uh, makes becomes important at large distances, and we have to solve the, uh, uh, the whole problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, the whole problem, before solving it, I will tell you, it's, it's, the solution is actually quite simple. You, in this plasma, it will boil down to, although you may already foresee it here, uh, you, it boils down to uh, placing a double layer inside inside this plasma and using Debye approximation. So all will be quite simple, but we need first, uh, before looking at the solution, we need to understand the physics of this uh, Wilson loop. Uh, it is... Uh, yes? Uh, okay, yes. Uh, uh, I didn't try it. I, I, I used uh, my favorite sign proportional here, but if I, the energy is 1 over E0 square, the standard uh, definition of electric charge is this in the continuum limit. So, in fact, in front of this integral, you have the terms 1 over E0 square. Okay? Because this uh, uh, th this came from 1 divided by E0 square, uh, sum of the cosines 1 minus cosine of x minu. That, that was the lattice action. As we go to the continuum limit, we have, we expand the cosine, we get E0 square here, uh, and uh, and uh, then we will have uh, the uh, when you have magnetic monopole, F menu for magnetic monopole is epsilon menu lambda Q epsilon menu lambda uh, x lambda divided by x cube. And uh, so the self energy of each monopole will be will contain q square, e zero square, and multiplied by some non universal constant. That's the self energy, um, and uh, this self energy defines the Debye screening radius. Mm. Uh, and that, that's uh, generally true for, non, for the non-abelian case as well, so it's, it's quite a general formula. Um, now, uh, where I was, um, the, oh yes, I wanted to, 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 to explain to you the, the physical meaning of the Wilson loop. Uh, the physical meaning of it and then we will, I will briefly show you how to calculate it. Um, the physical meaning of it is uh, quite simple. It, uh, when we have a particle in quantum mechanics, uh, suppose you have a particle propagating from one point to another. The um, amplitude for such propagation is exact amplitude is given by the Feynman formula. It's sum over all possible trajectories, e to the i classical action. But when you put the, this particle in, mag in the magnetic field, you have to add the term a mu x mu dot here. Uh, you can also write down the version of it, uh, four-dimensional version of it, which is uh, relativistically invariant. I'm here writing non-relativistic thing. So that's uh, the standard formula for propagation. And uh, then 
you can you see that um, to get the uh, to get the Wilson line, uh, not the loop. Uh, it, its physical meaning is that it's it is the amplitude for a particle, for a charged particle to propagate along a particular path. So when we have one path and not many, and we want to see the amplitude for the particle to propagate along this particular path, we just say that apart from irrelevant things, it's the integral over this contour of a mu dx mu. Okay, uh, but uh, uh, the question arises immediately. Uh, we, uh, how can we have uh, we have uncertainty principles? So how can we have uh, how the particle can propagate along a particular path? Because we have delta x and delta p of the order of h, so it will be necessarily. Um, Fuzzy, uh, but in certain limit we can make uh, this uh, the, the propagation along particular trajectory precise. What is the limit? In which limit you can say that particle follow a particular trajectory? Uh, well, p goes. To, uh, well, uh, you see, you need uh, coordinate and velocity. Uh, well defined both. From this, you see delta x delta v is of the order of h divided by the mass of the particle. If the mass goes to infinity, then uh, in this case you have x and x dot are well defined at, at, the, at a certain point. And uh, so uh, from this point of view, it's clear that the Wilson line describes the propagation of in infinitely heavy particle. I shall explain it. It's very important to understand, and I shall explain it in a different way. Um, so it's like studying uh, like the behavior of heavy quarks and QCD by, by studying Wilson. Groups. Yes, that's right. Uh, and I want to explain this. We will need it in a gravitational case also. Uh, normally, you have um, a propagator, a relativistic propagator. Suppose you calculate some diagram or something, and you have a relativistic propagator, um, p k p minus k square, and uh, we have the. Um, or let me begin with a, simply with a relativistic propagator p square minus m square. The first question which I want to ask you is how to go to non-relativistic limit in this propagator. So the propagator is p0 square minus p square minus m square. Uh, not quite, uh, but the, you you don't get in this way. If m goes to infinity, you don't get a non-relativistic propagator. So what should I do to go to non-relativistic limit here? It's yes. Heavy particles are usually non-relativistic. Yes. Yes, but to, to see it from the, di from the diagram, you need to do the following. Uh, you have P0, uh, M plus epsilon, okay? And now we have uh, the propagator becomes proportional to 1 divided by epsilon minus P square divided by 2M. Uh, now, this is, however, is not yet uh, the, what corresponds to Wilson loop. It's non-relativistic. A particle which is not following um, a particular path. However, if you take m to infinity here, you drop this term, and what kind of trajectory it describes? Now, particle follows one prescribed trajectory in space time. What is it? And then we will stop. <coughs> So 
So which, which trajectory is described by green function, which is simply epsilon plus I0? Uh, think of space xt representation of this guy. It sits in one place, in one place and propagates in time. And analogously, we can uh, deform it and get a propagation along the arbitrary contour. Okay, let's stop here.